We are going to be discussing a number of issues, but since cryptocurrency is going to be brought into the discussion, the obligatory disclaimer must be said that uh, none of this is investment advice. Uh, I myself am not a financial advisor. I'm not sure that any of our panelists even are. Uh, whatever we discuss today is for the sake of discussion. Um, and hopefully it is for the education of the participants in the audience and nothing more than that. Uh, thank you so much. And with that, I will try and manage this um, as best I can with new attendees coming in. But uh, thank you very much for all of us joining in for the inaugural, let's call it, uh, webinar on social sciences, the future of work uh, and DAOs. Um, today we have quite a few esteemed panelists with us. So firstly, um, I would like to introduce Ellie Rennie whom I met a few years ago from RMIT University, who is very much involved with the blockchain innovation hub there. Um, and Ellie, if you could please just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, that's right, I work at RMIT University. Uh, my background is political science and media and communication studies. Um, and I've been investigating blockchain in relation to three broad themes. Uh, one is cooperation, one is accountability, and one is inclusion. Now, a large part of my career was doing uh, work around digital inclusion in terms of the capabilities and opportunities um, of internet access. Um, I think that cooperation is a particularly interesting way to look at blockchain, which we often think of in terms of self-interest, uh, particularly when we start talking about economic incentives. But we didn't just get where we are as a species through self-interest. We also got here through working together. Um, I think as famous mathematician said it, it's not just the struggle for survival, it's also the snuggle for survival. And I think Decred is a really interesting technology with respect to community and coordination and working together. Uh, so there's some of the themes that I am interested in. I should say I was staking Decred at one point, that's my disclaimer. And then I stopped because I lost my keys. And when I say I lost my keys, I didn't lose my cryptographic keys. I lost the physical keys to the safety deposit box where my crypto cryptographic keys were kept and was in denial about the fact that I would have to essentially break into Gringotts in order to get them back. But I finally have them now, so you may see me in Decred forums at some point in the future. But thanks for having me. Look forward to it. Thank you for, for joining us. And uh, also from RMIT today, um, and, and this is very much on Ali's recommendation, we've got uh, Julian here, um, who is also uh, a researcher, a lecturer at RMIT, and we had a nice chat the other day. I knew, know that you were also involved with a few other organizations that were in the uh, blockchain space. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself today? Yeah, I love that, that you, um, you, you put the reputation, you put Ali's reputation, you staked it on the line. So if I say anything completely whack, uh, <laughs> it's your capital, Ali. You recommended this nut job. I also want to say that's um, deeply ironic that you lost your physical keys to your safety deposit box here. Anyway, um, Jules, yeah, lecturer in uh, entrepreneurship innovation and, and org design at RMIT. Um, and like a lot of academics, I'm interested in different things. I mean, I started, um, I'll come to the, the engagement with the world of crypto in a minute, but uh, my PhD work was actually on um, the early phase of co-working. So I was trying to understand how, um, groups of otherwise independent workers came together and sort of organized in this tribal like community arrangements that were often quite imperfect and it had their own politics. You don't see a lot of this happening in co-working spaces today, but in the early days it had this um, movement orientation around it. And that really, I was already interested in things like Wikipedia before that, but that brought me into the academic world of trying to understand what uh, elements are managing common resources and how, um, these sort of non-bureaucratic, um, ostensibly meritocratic communities come together to organize work, but also have their own problems. Um, and then when crypto, one of the places at the end of my PhD, um, or one of the places I ended up, were well, wow, this, these sort of communities, to do this well, they really need their own form of contributory, contributory accounting systems, yeah? Because there's all this kind of work that gets done, um, some of it's paid, some of it's unpaid, 
there's all this dark matter around how um, competence is assessed in these communities, um, as there often are in open source communities. And it'd be really helpful to have new kinds of ledger technology, et cetera. It was about the time um, Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and other projects were, were gaining traction. So I started looking at that um, specifically with the startup called Kaikuma. So if anyone here, there's probably some flex stats folks or whatever around. I was a co-founder of that, still going. Um, and our initial interest, or at least my interest, was in creating a DAO-like structure. So I got very interested in the, the philosophy of the DAO, if you like, with all its irony, the Dao De Ching and all the rest. Um, but I guess I approach it much more as a sociologist of work. So I know my disclaimer is I don't own any decred. I, know, um, I don't know much about the project as our um, conversation went, but I guess the, the most productive role I could play is um, thinking of it in terms of sociology, you know, including some of the classic issues that sociologists like Marx and Weber were, were thinking about around problems associated with work. And I'm curious about how this community is trying to address those issues. Well, I'm glad you're here to ask us these questions. Um, uh, and, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of questions that we could have a bit of conversation about during and also after this session, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, and we've just had, um, what I want to do is go through all of the, the members here that are sort of haven't been with Decred for so long. Um, uh, and so we've just had Richard uh, Welsh join us, otherwise known as Mr. Bowl. Um, who recently wrote a, a very intriguing article uh, known as Forks in the Road, which I sent to Ellie, and she was very fascinated by that. Uh, Richard, are you able to hear us? Um, yeah. And yeah, okay, he's showing his face too. Fantastic. Yeah. Richard, we've just had a few intros. I'm not sure how much of that you got, you got to hear, but um, we just want to sort of intro everybody to our audience. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so uh, I started out about well, 15 years, 20 years ago uh, in TV. So making documentaries and um, uh, ser series for British broadcasters. So um, people at like the BBC and Channel 4. Uh, and then uh, I was developing shows and this is at the sort of dawn of the social networking era. So about 2006, 2007, it's sort of YouTube arrived and um, we had a social network called uh, Bebo, which I don't know if anyone remembers, but it was sort of, it was big in New Zealand and the UK and a few other countries. And um, uh, I remember with a friend of mine, I was making music videos um, and we decided uh, this guy had a band and it was like, why don't we make, uh, why don't we build something a bit different? And we sort of figured out that we could, we could kind of scale audiences on, on this social network pretty quickly. And so we built the biggest music audience on Bebo. Um, and we had like about 200,000 uh, fans on, uh, on this social network. And suddenly the record labels wanted to sign the band. And it was a realization that the sort of the real power of kind of, of, of building communities that suddenly had an effect in the real world. And uh, that sort of led on to a project that I did with MySpace where we made a drama that was again kind of music based set at kind of music festivals around Europe um, was again a weird kind of merging of, of social networks, community building, um, uh, film and TV storytelling and kind of this two way interaction between a kind of producer or a creator and an audience. And that sort of thing is pretty normal now, but at the time it was not normal at all. Um, and so we were kind of figuring out what is now called, I guess, community development or audience development. Um, we then went on, uh, was a friend of mine had, had an idea, um, and we turned the, the idea into a social game that we, we launched on Facebook, um, that had Nike involved and Red Bull. And the idea was that it was a sort of choose your own adventure, sort of filmmaking, um, game or film game where you live the life of a footballer, a professional footballer. So do I go out tonight or do I party with the lads and, and or do I stay and be a professional, uh, like a model pro? Um, and that was, uh, that kind of got to 15 million players on Facebook. And then I think quite a lot of the stuff that people are realizing or have realized in the last five or seven years with the, with the sort of threat of the social networks, Facebook changed the sort of the algorithm they shifted to mobile, they shut down social gaming. And that was the kind of, um, that was a kind of realization of platform risk, 
of like, well, you can build these audiences, you can create this, this incredibly sort of vibrant thing. We had a, a, a kind of, crypt, well, it wasn't a cryptocurrency, but it was a kind of a virtual currency within the game. Um, and it was incredible to see that you could motivate people to do different things. People were spending 10 pounds on virtual goods. So Cristiano Ronaldo boots, and we were selling more Nike boots than Nike were in the real world at one point. Um, it was called the I, I Am Player, and there's still sort of um, uh, videos on YouTube, and kids, like teenagers, lost their minds for it. It was amazing. Um, but uh, that sort of led on to uh, a project called Copper 90. Um, and Copper 90 was uh, funded by Google and YouTube. We built this massive audience on, on Facebook. Uh, and Google and YouTube at the time uh, were trying to sort of uh, accelerate the quality of programming on YouTube. And they created something called the YouTube Originals. And you might remember it, but in the US, they funded Vice and Red Bull and a bunch of big YouTubers. Um, and we were funded in, the, in Europe, the first funded in Europe, uh, alongside Jamie Oliver and a bunch of other channels here. Uh, and yeah, and, and that was sort of, I, I led that for three years. Um, as the sort of creative director um, and we brought on big brands and we built this massive audience around the world uh, first on YouTube then on Facebook um, and uh, it was a it was really amazing for the first three years and then I started to ask sort of slightly tricky questions so we had a, a two or three big investors come in so big VCs came in from the US first yeah three of them from the US so um, Turner Broadcasting um, uh, um, another uh, uh, Liberty Global who are a big cable company and uh, I started to kind of question well how do we scale this from a monetary perspective whilst also kind of keeping the community together and it it never really like sat well with me because we were sort of saying we were going to take football back for fans we were very much on the fans side um, but there was always this sort of contradiction of like, well, actually really we're harvesting massive amounts of data. We're packaging this up, we're selling this. Um, so yeah, so, uh, I, I left off three years, um, and then had fallen down the Bitcoin kind of crypto rabbit hole, probably this is 2015, something like this. A, fr a friend of mine had, had had a blockchain startup and he, um, uh, and, and yeah, and I, I went through the kind of, uh, Bitcoin cycle where I was interested in color counterparty and color coins and all these different things and then found ethereum did that kind of did a big cycle of ethereum thought that was the answer and then probably on the third or fourth time around i discovered decred and realized that the, the questions i was asking myself or other people were about sustainable funding governance like all these things and it was like oh right and i and I, I discovered it once and then I think I bought some and then just this is what happens in crypto. You don't really realize what you found until like probably a year after you found it. So anyway, if you're lucky. So yeah. So and that's and Forks in the Road was really my kind of um, experience of uh, joining the community, um, trying to find a route into a community, um, struggling probably to to kind of like get across some of the ideas that I was talking about, like, and just really, it was a, an experience of, of how we've, this stuff is so complicated because everyone like comes from different parts of the world. Like people are at different levels of understanding um, and scaling and kind of, um, kind of building communities online, specifically when you've also got money now involved is really really complicated and really hard and uh it was kind of trying to draw some lines uh to kind of how a, a community might move forward and how i might kind of structure something that was i don't know balanced enough that people could see like where they might fit into that sort of matrix that i did which again was recommended to me a couple of those points by people in the community and i think i just i think i just sort of tried to create an objective view of like where Decred was right now. Um, anyway. Wow, thank you. That is quite the introduction and quite the journey. Um, and now to uh, our ongoing, we've, got, we've had Elian showing his face for quite some time um, and it's quite late where you are. You're in, uh, you're in Mexico at the moment. Uh, what time is it over there? Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, it's around 2 a.m. here. Uh, happy to be, here, to be here in this very international call. 
we're, we're hitting three different time zones. So that's, that's a bit exciting, uh, very, very international. Um, so yeah, I, I've been around, like my background is in political science. Uh, I've been around the cryptocurrency space since 2016, but professionally since 2018. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I originally was working on other stuff. Uh, but then I, I went down the rabbit hole and I found the, all this technology quite fascinating, uh, both on the economic impact that might have, how, how money is, is being disrupted by these technologies, but then the social side of it, how do we organize, how do we, we build communities around common goals, um, and how this, uh, these communities work on their own, um, as mentioned, on their own rules, on their own politics, um, so I, I found this kind of con this intersection between technology, money, uh, and social organization quite fascinating, and that's I think that's why uh, I'm quite uh, interested in in, in Decred, and I'm I'm quite happy to work in the project because um, it's kind of touching these these three points. So for the past two years, I've been working on building the the Latin American uh, ecosystem, uh, the Spanish speaking ecosystem. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here and, and talk more about what, what the future of uh, money, uh, remote work, uh, social collaboration, and, and basically these technologies would look like in, in, in a couple of decades. Yeah, and I, and I do know that with, with yourselves, it's, it's like because it's a global organization, you've, you've really focused on the Latin American Spanish speaking world, like it also into Spain as well. Uh, and it's interesting how the, the community goes broad, but it also has to go granular. Uh, exactly. And that, there's that aspect of it as well. So, um, yeah, it'd be really good to, to get your insights today. And um, very quickly, I, I just want to sort of hear from Richard Red here because, um, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to uh, take his thunder, but I remember reading the other day, and I don't know what the professional term is, but I saw in his words, he described himself as a social data scientist, but I would like to hear what he, how he would introduce himself. Yeah, uh, social data science is fairly accurate, I'd say. I, I did um, research in some social science departments for a number of years, and I also studied statistics. And I guess a lot of the stuff that I've done since I finished uh, education, like formal education, more in the research uh, domain, it's been fairly quantitative and, and heavy on the like data science elements. But I've been, I'm interested in uh, other aspects, like other approaches and stuff as well. So um, the, my general interest is in online peer production communities. That's why I studied mostly, or why I study still mostly. Uh, things like Wikipedia, which has been mentioned already, also Reddit and Stack Overflow and sites like that. So to make my sort of introduction to Decred short, I recognized it eventually uh, there was basically a, an online peer production community of a different type because it had these different tools. It had this treasury to fund work on its various open source projects and it had a way for people, well not necessarily people, but tickets to make decisions about what would be happening with the network in the future. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop it there. Thanks. Yeah, so we've had some really big intros, and um, what I like is that you know this is being recorded, so that if we do have everyone on the on on this particular uh, webinar topic again, um, we've sort of got the audience intro to you. Um, it would be nice if we have this continued in the future, uh, and the reason being is that we have actually had a planning session, and the discussion went so well that I was saying, "Look, guys, can we save this for the event?" Um, I've got a few questions here prepared. Oh, and before I go go any further, we also have the Jerry, who will not show their face or make themselves audible, but they will uh, make their comments um, in the chat, which we will share with uh, the audience. Um, the Jerry is, uh, well, how should we describe them? A pseudonymous decred legend. Um, so, without further ado, um, we want to talk today about social sciences, the future of work, incentive alignment, DAOs, um, you know, contractor models, community building, what are the drivers, what keeps the community working, COVID and you know, work from home. It's, it's just had this huge impact on so many different industries where I know that in Melbourne, Australia, they actually closed off uh, the central business district where all the skyscrapers are and there was even fines. 
um, you know, stated that if people go to work, they would be fined. Um, and so here we are forced into this position, whereas organizations uh, operating in a contractor remote model such as Decred have been kind of doing this for a while. Um, I know that uh, Richard Red wanted to, to discuss a little bit about uh, transaction mechanisms within communities or organizations um, and, and how, to, how to fund public good. Richard, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll just say briefly about that one. Um, uh, that, well, I'm not sure about the transaction mechanisms, but the funding of public goods is definitely, I think Decred is really interesting from that perspective because it's, I think it's, its mechanism is unique as far as I know with the 10% of every block reward. You have these blocks every five minutes on the Decred network. They all have block rewards associated with them as with other networks like Bitcoin. But in Decred's case, 10% of all of those rewards are going into a, a fund that's then available to pay the people who work on the open source uh, aspects of the project, mostly. Or really, any aspect of the project that the stakeholders think is worth spending this funding on to develop the project. But most of it goes into the, the software development. So uh, that's a, a kind of touch point to the rest of open source and peer production where funding is often an issue because these resources are free, freely accessible, free, free to everyone. So a lot of conventional ways of generating revenue are not applicable. And most of the projects are funded by donations or by providing support services around the open source software. So Decred, it takes it like a huge step further, I would say, by having the software project that just by people running it all over the world and using it as it's intended to, to generate a currency and a currency network, it also like has this byproduct of funding its own development, which I think is really interesting. And that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so it's very interesting and in how it's grown to beyond software. It's now what we had like a comic book series, um, you know, we've got, lots of people doing a variety of things. Um, it's, it's like we're working for, we, we're literally working now for an autonomous digital entity, not, not particularly one person or a CEO or a board of directors per se. It's, it's interesting. And this leads on to the next two questions, which I know others wanted to, to, to describe. I'm going to skip, I know other, but just full disclosure, everyone, all the panel, panelists have been exposed to these questions and they've marked their names next to, to certain ones. But I just want to skip number two for a second because it leads in. What are some of the issues that arise when economic interests are incorporated into peer production communities and organizations? You see, we've talked about how, for those that aren't familiar, Decred actually has um, its own treasury. And so that's where the money comes from rather than being venture capitalist funded or funded by, um, let's say, an entity that, that has their own agenda and wants to be autocratic and, and, and directive. No, it's actually a, a decentralized treasury. So what are some of the issues? Um, and I'll, I'll leave it open. Um, maybe we can hear from Richard Welsh first. Ah, you're on mute, my, my friend. Uh, it's... Um... It's a, it's a question I think that, that follows on nicely from, from what Richard Red was saying there about, um, about public service funding or public funding. Um, and it's the interesting thing that I sort of noted when, when I arrived was that, because Richard, he hasn't mentioned so far, but he published something called CryptoCommons.cc, uh, which is a which is a kind of online resource, which actually, which actually in many ways sort of filled a lot of gaps for me uh, in uh, my understanding of cryptocurrencies uh, and just to sort of very well I'm describing Richard's work, but it's a sort of resource that covers a wide range of cryptocurrencies that, that also dives into the governance features and, and um, the kind of funding features. And I sort of looked at it and I thought, oh wow, that's amazing. But it's also, it was amazing because it was funded by the treasury, it was it was part of Richard's research, and looking at the kind of like the politeia kind of proposal system, it's it was amazing for me to sort of realise and sort of make links into what I'd done before that oh this is funding more than just software, this is funding marketing, this is funding kind of uh, content, and I think that's the that for me was like a light bulb moment where I thought this this is a this is a way of sustainably funding 
um, uh, production or, or peer production, as sort of people have said, online. And once you sort of can do that, then the kind of the, the, the opportunities for, for, for funding different things are, are really limitless. And that was really the, the kind of core issue uh, with, uh, with, with online communities is how to, how to fund their kind of production and how to do it in a transparent way. Um, so, uh, yeah, have, have I gone slightly off, off topic? Uh, no, that's fine. That's great. Um, well, you see, this is the thing, like, I hope everyone does go to, to decred.org and, and watch a few of the videos on, and how this all works. But, uh, hopefully as a result of the topics that we discuss, we'll see how there is actually, I feel quite the need in today's, um, well, the world today uh, for, for these sorts of structures to come about. Let's hear from some of the current um, academia that we've got on our panel at the moment. I know that there's been some, quite a bit of research already done into this at the moment. I'll leave it open for you. Uh, I just, just to sort of ask the question again one more time, what are some of the issues that arise when economic interests are incorporated into peer production, um, into communities? I'm happy, to, I'm happy to kick off, Ali. And yeah. I don't have a good answer here, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and say something so I look smart and then retreat. <laughs> better than me. No. But I mean, this one thing, all right, uh, let's start at first principles. One thing I was, um, I noticed when I started engaging with the crypto world was um, often the tendency to view social relations through game theory and these other very engineering models that, well, if, if somebody wants to do something um, already for free, giving them money would only in, increase their motivation to do it, right? But a lot of the findings we have in social science don't, that, that, that's not what we, what we see, to be frank. So th there's some very famous studies around blood donations were done. I think Titmus was the economist, Ellie, you might know these back in the 70s. And what they found was that if you start to give money to, for people that, that were doing something voluntary, in this case, blood donations, it actually crowds out their motivation and you get less participation. This is, this is a point that someone like Yochev Denkler, um, who wrote The Wealth of Networks, sort of a legend in common space pre-production circles, kind of basically coined the term, um, initially made a, a big deal about in terms of, I think he put it as benevolent motivations. So Linux, you know, Wikipedia, these classic um, massively scaled common space pre-production projects, it seemed to be a feature, not a bug, that um, they were largely fueled by uh, voluntary forms of labor. Now, of course, this set up other problems that they were ultimately funded. I mean, Linux developers were, you know, employed by Microsoft or whatever in the day and, and patching, and, you know, do, doing their stuff voluntarily on the weekend or night or, or Wikipedia. A lot of the Wikipedia labor is people like Ali and I that have, you know, academic positions and then we get mm -hmm. our kick out of, you know, um, making some pedantic point about German history or something. On, in a Wikipedia note. So th there are certainly problems with that model, but when crypto first appeared, I was just very interested in this question. On one level, it seemed great that there was a way of financing this work. What I feared early on, and to some degree, I think a lot of projects suffered from this sense, is as soon as you introduce monetary incentives, especially ones that can be decoupled from labor, i.e. speculative, you know, uh, you get all sorts of distortions in the system that actually crowds out the motivation to participate. And the example I always use here is if, if Jimmy Wales sold Wikipedia to Google tomorrow, you know, I mean, would, would people continue to, to donate freely to that project? Probably not. I, I assume we can't, governance-wise. But it's, it's a kind of, you know, extreme example that makes a point. So I'll pause for a second, but I'm super interested in how you see these tensions playing out in the decred world, if they do, or if that alignment of incentives is actually um, better. Ellie. Yeah, I think I think that that point about Wikipedia is an interesting one. I, I noticed De Gary's written here that there's also a hidden market for Wikipedia editors, which I didn't know. Um, that's rather alarming. Um, the um, I mean, I, I've heard similar comments made in relation to Bitcoin. Um, the Bitcoin core developer was saying to me last year that part of the success of, of that project uh, as opposed to say a lot of ICOs that happened on Ethereum was that it has maintained that open source ethic and that, you know, the, the, the ways in which reward occurs and economic incentives um, happen uh, are separated from um, that development work. Although that said, I'm sure they would, they would appreciate the kinds of transparency and funding models that Decred's managed to establish. 
I think the other thing that's really interesting in, in this is that when we think about um, how funding happens, we usually think that there's this private, uh, you know, there's the private sector, the market, and then there's public sector and um, uh, taxes and subsidy and the like. Uh, when in fact, when we look at how communities organize and, and, and self-govern themselves around resources, they often do it in quite surprising ways and in ways which are very effective for themselves. And Eleanor Ostrom's work is, um, ha has looked at that and, and, and delved into that over many, many decades around, say, water resources and, and the like and, and how communities create their own governance systems to manage resources. So maybe, maybe I'm not sure, Decred is another similar example of that. It's just a question rather than an answer. Um, but I, 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 I do have questions around Decred as well. Um, I suppose when you have people voting for, the, for how that uh, money is spent in the treasury, whether you just end up funding fun things or things that, you know, that people who are most, you know, able to persuade others, um, uh, uh, yeah, so I, the question's back to you around whether you do get effective outcomes as a result of that process or whether sometimes um, things get funded that you may later regret. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Um, I, I already do too much talking. I don't know whether I should answer that directly, but... Um, Could I uh, <laughs> say, say a little bit about uh, this question? Just generally, like the, I think it's like I think it's a really good point about the um, rewards, like interfering with people's motivation, especially like these kinds of payment rewards like, that people get. Uh, I, like I think it definitely it has a, a lot of uh, effects within decreds because it's a so it's a new like it's a new source of funding that other projects like decred don't have, like other open source projects don't have it. So it's there's a quite a lot of discussion around like how it should be used and so everybody like i'd say everybody agrees that it's definitely a, a good way to fund all of the development of open source software that like the core of the project all of the wallets and the block explorers and all of the kind of like central like aspects of the currency network it's everybody agrees on that but then there's sort of um it, it gets grayer then as you, you get away from that towards the more marketing related things where there seems to be a, a contingent in the community that says like, no, it, it should only be for the, the kind of open source software that it, like, and these other things like things like exchange integrations, maybe those are things that because it's possible to make a profit from, for the exchange that that should not be funded by the treasury because there is a kind of market based like system for, for funding that work where a cryptocurrency exchange will add pairs because they want to collect trading fees when their customers trade on those pairs. Like, so there's a kind of, I'd say there's a lot of uh, discussion around what the role of the Decred treasury is because it's a new thing and it's, it's not familiar. So people are, have different ideas about what it should and shouldn't be used to fund and because we've we've had Politea for about a year and a half now, which is the platform where we discuss this and, and vote. Um, so I'd say we're still very much in the process of figuring out like what exactly the treasury is good for funding and what should be funded through sort of conventional market-based methods and also other things that could be funded perhaps through donations. So we're looking to add a, a kind of donations element to the, the Politea platform where Decred stakeholders can also uh, tip each other for comments and maybe maybe we'll also see some sort of informal donation funding of, of small projects as well coming out of that because it's yeah it, it like you kind of solve one problem of right decred developers don't have to get a job with google or microsoft or like ibm or twitter or whoever wants to pay uh, cryptocurrency developers they don't have to worry about that but like it opens up new problems then about how do you draw the boundary around who can be paid from the treasury funds and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the treasury itself is, 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 is an entity for not just the community, but an organization and potentially many sub organizations, broad and granular, like we said before. 
Um, and in fact, the sheer fact that we have Politeer, the, the, the public proposal system, allows us to transparently propose and vote on how the treasury should be spent, which is, which is fantastic. Um, all uh, anchored to the blockchain, transparent and perpetual. Uh, so, I mean, Elian, you've been you've been with us since 2018 in a professional capacity, and you've you've brought Decred uh, to the non-English speaking world quite well. Um, you've had some incredible things. Like I've seen some of the the events that you've had, tours you've had, parties you've had um, in the Latin American world, and I'm like far out. I wish I was at that party. Um, and you man you managed to do it just based on what you proposed and what you, you've, you've done this Latin American proposal, we voted on it, it's been approved, um, it's been funded, it's, the community's grown, um, you've got different social media channels in different languages. I mean, it's enabled you to grow this community. I wanna know, what's the feel amongst this community? Is it based on, oh, I'm getting paid to do this or is it something else? Is there something more, Elian? Can you tell us about that? Uh, you're on mute, my friend. Amigo. <laughs> there you go, amigo. Um, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's, it's been this journey of uh, start as a, as a volunteer. I volunteered in the project for like around uh, four months. Uh, I did uh, a couple of translations, start with, with social media uh, in Spanish, uh, organize meetups, uh, basically kind of prove myself what was uh, my skills. Um, and what could I bring to the table on, on a voluntary basis? Um, and after this part is, is what I, 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 I was invited to the project to, to collaborate um, as a contractor to actually get paid for my work. Uh, after I proved what was, uh, what was my, my ability, what was the value that I could bring to the table. Um, it, I found it quite interesting, this, this question on if uh, economic incentives uh, misalign uh, or reduce the motivation for people to work on a, on a voluntary basis. Um, I mean, it, it's on the one hand, it's uh, people need to pay the rent. Uh, so this is when, I'm, when, I, when I start to do this and I see how, how a lot of people work on a voluntary basis, I'm like, how do you pay the rent? Like, how do you manage to, to actually, you know, earn a living working on a voluntary basis? Um, then I kind of realized all this gig economy that works, uh, that happened on, on the cryptocurrency industries in which, well, maybe a developer is working a couple of hours here, a couple of hours there. Um, so it's, 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 there are not all the eggs on one basket for say it in a way. Um, but definitely uh, the way I found the, all this work that I do at Decred, um, it, be, it becomes more and more challenging because Decred is quite a technical community uh many of the people that are, that are uh you know like uh that are very involved in the project are quite technical people um that are looking into numbers into code and my my area of expertise which is marketing which is communication it it, it sometimes doesn't work the way code works in which something is quite straightforward right um but this is this is quite fascinating to me to see that there is actually um and it just just as a brief, um, the first year that I work on the project, I was working on a budget from the marketing, sort of a general marketing budget that was approved by stakeholders. Then uh, I made a proposal for the for Politeia for stakeholders approval, in which I I, um, I worked for six months on this budget. And now I recently, uh, less than a month ago, I present another proposal that was approved for a work for another six months. However, in this last proposal, we received uh, quite big opposition from the community of stakeholders, um, which has been for me kind of a, a, a pressure, a kind of a, a pressure point because we, as a, as a team in Latin America, we had to kind of review our strategy. What are we doing? What are we doing good? What are we doing bad? Uh, because there was a clear opposition on Politeia. So um, I'm, I'm now on this position of how this how I, as a, as a person working on the project, uh, get information from this community of stakeholders that some might have a face, uh, somebody telling me directly in a personal way, and some might be anonymous or pseudonymous, but anyway, uh, they're part of this community of stakeholders. Um, I believe, and this is kind of a, a question that we talked last time about how does uh, 
having a currency as part of the infrastructure of the network allows for innovation to happen. Um, my argument there was that it was a, a, an essential part of the, infra of the infra infrastructure to happen because otherwise, how can people innovate if they don't have to pay the rent? This is kind of my, my part of, uh, I'm kind of in this, how do I, this conflict between voluntary work and paid work, because on the one hand, this you do voluntary work because you love something, because you're passionate about something, but on the other hand, how do you pay the rent? And, and this is where I see the treasury and how the project fund itself as, as fascinating and, and quite innovative. innovative. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's so much that we could discuss on this point. I mean, look, we have the public proposal system where once a proposal is up, people can comment on it um, and, and give feedback. People can comment on the comments, they can upvote the comments. But if people don't comment, you don't necessarily know why if, if there is opposition. So that's a good question to, to bring up. We've had quite a few uh, questions brought up in the chat and I don't know whether or not we should switch between um, what's being asked in the chat and the Q&A or go back to our questions here. I just wanna to touch base on something that Julian has asked in the chat if it um, hasn't been brought up. I'm just gonna read the question, but I feel like it's a bit of a longer conversation. Um, which parts of the Decred project work as well um, as, as a DAO, i.e. software development, and which require more messy forms of collaboration, i.e. branding, marketing, etc. You say that you have a view on this. Well, it's funny because we've been actually discussing this uh, in, our, in our community quite a bit. Uh, and, and me being a community manager in Australia, um, there has been people saying that, look, if there's going to be an invoice, I need something matched to a line item on that invoice. And that's, that's something that's going to be going up. And we've been trying to figure out a way to put up a proposal for Australia. Um, just a few of us that have been talking about it. I know that I had a look at um, uh, Elian's proposal, but I'm like, yeah, that works for Latin America and what they're doing. It doesn't necessarily work for us. So it can get a little bit messy about trying to, to establish something. Julian, can you tell me what your thoughts are? Because I'd, I'd, I'd like to bring it to our discussion back in the decred circles. <laughs> so this is, on one level, we could step back again to first principles and, and say, well, what was the problem around organizing work that DAOs were put forward to solve? And um, that's, a, that's a complex question, complex answer. But one of them, if, I, if you allow me a minute, I'll frame that in terms of classic problems, right? Often there's, there's some notion of, um, disliking bureaucratic forms of organization, managerial hierarchies. You know, I watched the video on Decred and it's, it's the insert of, what is that, that 1999 film, Office Space, so the boss asking you to work on the weekend. And, you know, we have all these, these cultural artifacts of Dilbert cartoons in the office. And, and so often DAOs, now this might not be the case for everybody um, listening to this, but it seems to me at a discursive level, DAOs are like, wouldn't it be great if work was like this, yeah? Um, that it was meritocratic, there were hierarchies of competence, not, um, you know, who's mates with the boss or is the boss an asshole or whatever it is. Um, and it seems to me, and that usually that seems to be modelled on open source software projects, and it seems to me some problems, especially within the world of software, are amenable to that form of organisation for a number of reasons, because they can be broken down into very modular and granular parts. Um, there's a sort of cultural infrastructure within software development around standards. You can run code, uh, you know, and see whether it works or not, test it, et cetera. So there's all these kind of protocols around um, certain problems that can be decentralized in that way. Um, and I know Wikipedia was criticized on this, but Wikipedia functions in a similar way. You can edit one word, you know, you can correct it in five minutes. Um, then there's another set of problems, usually when uncertainty is higher, um, and a lot of entrepreneurial work is fundamentally this, like who is, what is value for this? Who is our user, you know? And whilst we might think of entrepreneurship as a startup, I mean, designing a brand or designing marketing, these tend to involve messier, uncertain, a uh, high degree of uncertainty, messier back and forwards, um, require high fidelity touch points, communication in much more of this spontaneous stuff. Um, I often use the example of like a comedy troupe trying to design a sketch comedy for Saturday Night Live, right? This is a sort of work that you just cannot well distribute, or at least we haven't seen versions of that. People tend to need to be in the same room bouncing ideas off each other. Um, so my, my basic point there is there's a class of problems that I'm not saying can never be dowed, <laughs> just turned it into a verb, but um, 
feel like a, a lot thornier too. And and my I guess my critique would be if the ideological position is everything should be organised in this way, um, I think it's going to run up against a lot of human messiness and people are going to be a bit disillusioned. I'll put that out there as a provocation. Yeah, I, I, I can... Oh, sorry. Go for it, Richard. Go. I thought you'd be provoked. <laughs> Go on, Rich. Yeah, you didn't specify your Richard there. Um, oh, sorry. Go for it. <laughs> I heard your voice first. Okay. It was both Richards that were talking. Um, no, I'll, I'll keep it short and just say that the, um, like the DAO, so, so the Decred is not, not trying to do all of this with the uh, DAO really. It's, it's kind of uh, trying to be quite tactical about where the DAO comes into it. So the, let's say Decred, like the, the software projects, even the main, like main repositories or program projects like the, uh, the node DCRD, that's a, it's its own like independent open source software project that has its own set of contributors and they're basically like autonomous. They'll make decisions as any other set of like contributors to an open source project would. Um, it's, it's small, like the, the number of contributors tends to be small for most of these projects in terms of people that actually are there consistently and, and would naturally kind of get a stay in, in any big decisions about development or contribute to the, the sort of peer review process for code quality. So that's all happening as it would with, with any other open source software project. But then you have a, a proposal in Politea which will say, um, we want to make this new project part of the kind of Decred ecosystem. So an example that happened uh, not too long ago was it's called Tiny Decred. It's a set of uh, Python tools that one of the community members had been developing in their own time. But it got to a point where they thought it had value for the community. So they created a proposal which basically said, um, like, give this a budget of less, I think it's $20,000. Uh, if you give it a budget of $20,000 to continue sort of developing it, we'll make it sort of fully uh, integrated with the, the Decred. Uh, like organization on, on GitHub and it'll basically become a, a fully fledged like Decred supported project. And then it'll continue working exactly the same way as it was before, the same person's leading it, but they now have a, a budget that they can command to, to pay the contributors to that particular uh, newly funded program. The other way that the DAO comes into it then is, is probably more important and it's, because it's, it's, this is all about the, the Decred cryptocurrency network, we've all got to run it on the same rules. We can't just uh, fork the, the code and change aspects of the consensus rules because we'll end up on different networks. So that's really the, the kind of key innovation of Decred is that there's a, a fundamental voting system built right into the blockchain itself where it's always sort of ticking in the background. And that's how you change any of the rules. Like that's the only way to change the rules is to run your new uh, code that has this new, uh, whatever the new rules are, you release a new version that has those rules. And then the stakeholders, they have to engage in this formal process of voting to approve that change to the rules before it will run on the network. So that's the kind of, like, it, it's not, it's not like, it's, it's much more complicated than just saying that there's a DAO like doing this. The DAO is doing like a couple of very specific things it's deciding which projects get funded and it's deciding which ways the consensus rules can change on the network. Now you've muted yourself. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Mr. Bob, would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah, well, I think this is the, the core of, of everything really. It's, it's the messy, messy part between uh, what, kind of Decred, Decred kind of a currently existing is almost like an open source software studio where there is a clear kind of product roadmap and then sort of digital communities and, and certainly the adoption of the underlying cryptocurrency. And Decred's, uh, it's not been mentioned I don't think before now, but Decred's made some certain decisions which are quite nuanced uh, and aren't necessarily in the constitution, but not using paid media to kind of market the project, which aligns really well with the constitution, with building kind of a fairer financial system, not with, with not using sort of surveillance capitalism tools with Google and Facebook, but it also hamstrings the project, like in many ways from an awareness thing, because if, if we were, if I was launching a sort of 
uh, a big campaign around um, around Decred, then one of the, the tools that people obviously can use is is kind of paid media, and that's a good way of getting people's attention. So I think that that messy part there of of how to essentially scale the community, or even should the community scale from a from a kind of cultural perspective, the it's the biggest debate right now, um, and I think that that right now Decred is positioned as a sort of community directed store of value, um, which um, which enables it to effectively fund open source software development. But as Julian and Richard have said, is is that or certainly Julian that this sort of part of the the way you get agreement around things that are much more kind of emotionally led or much more kind of um, messy in their in their in their positioning it really becomes hard and this is the sort of the real test of decreds uh, of the politeer process um, of a lot of the debates that are happening right now in the community um, how how do we reposition it so that you can cater for lots of different visions lots of different views and I've sort of had this thought for a while about that, that really you've got a kind of x-axis and a y-axis. You've got sort of two vectors that we're trying to figure out. And one of them is a, a technology vector, which is we just build more and more infrastructure for enabling governance and enabling input and enabling conversation. And that can be secured to the blockchain and it can be transparent and it, it, can, be, it can be open. And then there's this culture vector, which is like, well, how do you kind of get people to agree on things that that a lot of the time they can only get once they've seen it? And I think part of what I've sort of been trying to puzzle through with Decred and with the Politea kind of proposal system is, is there a way to kind of raise money? Well, there, there is a way. Like if, if I had um, like external investment or money, maybe the way to think about it is you build in advance to show people kind of what your um, what you're trying to say, you show the community the value because it's very hard to explain to a kind of software developer what a kind of um, why launching a kind of community around music would be a good thing for the community. Um, and so, in that way, you then sort of build back to the uh, to the treasury, or you you build the, the project first, and then say to the community, "Look, this is this is kind of what we mean." and the hard thing as well it wrapped up in all of this is how do we how do we apportion value to the project is it in the coin price is it in the uh is it in the the kind of the, the 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 productivity like a lot of the debates in marketing right now have been there's lots of work that have been done and no one can debate the hard work but so far the 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 coin price hasn't gone up in in a, a while so i think the the tying of of like key performance indicators to certain projects that are outside of the, uh, the scope of kind of software development is very much the kind of the, 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 the touchy subject or the difficult subject. And that's why I think I've been so interested in like, is it a, is there a sub DAO? Like, are there other ways to issue tokens? Like what, what is the machinery to enable these alternative visions to kind of come to light and be sustainably funded? Uh, Elian looks like he's trying to say something. Yeah, I would like to add just a phrase that uh, one of my one of my colleagues uh, at Decred in Latam mentioned, and she said, um, "Organic growth does not come without a, a, a bit of chaos." Um, and there is definitely this this something that I see is that when you don't have a, a, a you know like a traditional um, hierarchical, hierarchical organization in which you have your a CEO, a CMO, all these positions of a, of a coordination, um, it becomes messy because we need to agree. We need to we need to uh, agree on something and come to a consensus. And I think that's why Politeia is such a powerful tool because it allowed us to to look for that consensus and to iterate. That is something that I also see. That it, this is this is an iteration, and we're constantly. Not only on the on the software side of things, but also on the on the marketing, communication, PR, all this work that is not uh, so easily measurable or not so easily uh, seen. Um, it's a constant iteration, and it's definitely come with chaos. I, I definitely see um, in the in the two years that I've been in the project in the community, I've seen. Uh, more and more people get involved and more and more um, persp persp different perspectives 
um, us on, on, on the project. And, and it, it creates definitely some chaos. Um, but I think this is kind of the beauty of this sort of a digital collective or di this uh, collective intelligence that it gets, um, it's, it's a constant feedback from this collective. Um, so I think chaos, with, with chaos also come, comes this possibility of hearing different uh, perspectives and, and sort of, a, yeah, it, it's, it's such a diversity of, of, of visions. The, the other thing I'll just very quickly say on that is that the, it's, there's also, Decred is unique in the fact that its time horizon is like decades. So like the, I'm used or have been used to working uh, with investors or uh, with, uh, with certainly with brands, like where you might, they might have a time horizon of six months or 12 months, like maximum. And if you're, if you're taking money for an investor, you, you maybe have like a four or five year time horizon. Like with, with Decred, there is funding potentially it like as long as the so the price stays relative where it is for for decades and and in a, way, in a weird way that that kind of in some ways means that debate can kind of become very circular a lot of the time because well why like let's not commit to stuff now because we want to protect the future but also it it means that perhaps like the debate and the kind of discussion can and this is i've had to learn really is that it, maybe this is a kind of chaotic approach and that maybe when you feel like you're not making progress, maybe you are. It's just the progress is very, very slow. Um, and that, that I just, it, it's, it's a weird sort of, we live in such a sort of quick fix society and culture where people want answers straight away and people want stuff built tomorrow and like we need clicks and likes and all these things. So it's a really, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but it's, it's the, the time horizon for me of the funding affects a huge amount of the culture um, and the behavior of the network. I think that's really fascinating. Um, you know, in the research sector where I work, um, we have a similar problem, which generally falls down to that question of, do you fund pure scientific research or do you fund something that's going to get a quick outcome um, and satisfy the KPIs of universities and, you know, government, media releases and the like. Um, and of course we've sacrificed that longer term horizon because everyone just wants, they want, they want to show a publication now or the, you know, the impact, research impact. And if, if what these infrastructures are doing is enabling us to think long term, then that's an, an amazing contribution. Um, and, and the other thing which is kind of interesting there is that's what they are, they're infrastructures. Um, and we don't even know necessarily how they're going to be used uh, in the future. We're, we've got some ideas. And a, a part of the reason why I love these kinds of forums is often this is where you get the kind of really creative and adventurous ideas around what they're for. Um, even though, of course, some of the more pragmatic uses might be, well, I live in a country where my own currency is failing and we need an alternative. Um, so there are immediate uses which are also really important and, and have real outcomes for people. So I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that idea that, of these longer term horizons. Um, I should say, um, Mr. Bulb, I also love that part of your paper where you're talking about, um, you know, the kind of, I've forgotten what you call them, the mini decreds or the sub decreds that could come out of the forks. Um, as, as an idea of, of how this system could evolve. And I, I wanted to ask you about that and, and, and where that idea came from and what, um, what inspired that. Well, the, uh, I'll preface everything, uh, well, this next section with the fact that I, I came in with an agenda um, because everyone always has an agenda. And I think people maybe don't recognize that whether they have biases or not, they do. And um, I, I have a, uh, I, I've been trying to figure out this, how do you fund digital communities for like seven years? And um, arriving at Decred, I think, uh, like I just said before about the, the short term thing, I arrived in the community and, and kind of sort of talked about a bit about my background. And I think it was during a period where Decred were paying a PR agency. Um, and 
I, I thought, well, you know what, there's, there's, a, there's, there's money here, there's a community here, I could see where I could add value. And I thought it would be a relatively easy argument to make, like that, like, look, well, here's our background, we've built this massive global brand, we've got a kind of brilliant creative team here in the UK, we've got a network of distributed kind of creators. Um, we, can, we can build the value around the project that, that you need, uh, or so I sort of thought. And it, it wasn't that the, the reaction was entirely hostile, but it was certainly, um, it was, it was, there was more pushback than I'd initially expected. And I think at that point I took a step back um, from necessarily just putting a proposal up and saying, this is what I want to do, because it seemed like there was a huge chasm of understanding um, between where the project was and what I was trying to sort of say. And some people kind of got the in instinct and the ideas, but, um, but that sort of then led on to me kind of writing this paper about the different cultures that kind of, kind of currently exist. And for people who haven't sort of read it, it was this idea that generally people fall on a kind of progressive mindset where like the, the, pro the, the, the platform or the, the, the technology is there to be built on. There's a kind of conservative mindset, which is a, a, on the other axis, like the other end, like that where the kind of the, the building of the money is the, is the end of it itself. And then you kind of have within that, you have this kind of um, uh, a kind of uh, a mindset that is a, a cypherpunk kind of mindset, which is like, uh, we're going to burn down the system, like talk about fight club and like, and, and that whole kind of like anti sort of authoritarian or anti capitalistic or anti corporate kind of mentality which is very much kind of um, born from kind of open source um, communities. And then you have an investor mindset. And so all of these things, and I think people actually struggle to be, uh, to, to like, I think people, most people operate at any one point on that at any one time. Um, but the, the, the thought was around, well, um, from where Decred is, maybe, maybe there is a way to uh, kind of create DAOs. So, sub DAOs, so um, decentralized autonomous organizations that are kind of mothered by the parent and that allows the, the community to kind of splinter off. Um, you see in other, in other projects that certainly with Bitcoin, you have these forks of the code base. So it was kind of an open question is like, is there a way to do a friendly version of that where Decred becomes the kind of, again, a parent to this, uh, these new networks without splintering the community. Um, side chains like uh tokenization on decred like uh to similar to something called counterparty and and um the, so the ability to issue a bit like icos um uh like tokens on top of decred and and this is the kind of i think the really messy space where you start to talk about uh you start to accept that these different cultures do exist these different ideologies or different views or different ways to scale this community do exist so then it comes to a kind of look well how do you how do you kind of um how do you enable those to happen and enable them to have their own governance or sub governance um and maybe that's the way to scale things and th this is right in the sort of like the, the the tip of where the discussions are with with decred and i know probably uh, Elian and, and Richard have got some thoughts on it as well, but um, but yeah, it's it. I don't have an answer. I guess I've just been trying to probe for people to kind of like come forward. Um, and yeah, my sense is that um, yeah, that I'll let the others fill in. Can I say something about that? That's not as a sort of interlude. I, I'm super interested to hear what Elian and the others say about the decred answer, but I'm feeling the need to insert some old school sociology into this, but one, one, of the, um, one of the things I found fascinating about the early phase of blockchain communities, uh, crypto, is the politics and ideological tribalism that was on display. And often, that is often there at the beginning of new technologies. You know, this is something that Ali, I mean, Jason's written a lot about, uh, Ali, in terms of innovation commons. So the beginning of homebrew computers, you have these amateur sort of, um, you know, this, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, conviviality, you know, where people are sharing and people, and then when money gets on the table, things shift. So there's that dynamic. But from Satoshi's paper, it seemed to inflame, or it opened up this libertarian wet dream around money, divorce from the state, around 
work, divorce from bureaucracies, etc. And so that introduced a, a set of a set of tribal affiliations, I'll call them, that were really interesting when they came together and then when they self-selected and, and formed their own communities. And I think what you're what I hear you saying in, in that, Richard, in your paper is um, around this question of when, when does it serve the project long term to iron out some of these differences or hang out together and resolve them through discussion or when does it make sense to actually fork, you know, and form their own um, technologically enabled, technically supported visions for how to organise differently. The, the link to old school sociology is I... Sometimes in these conversations, I hear uh, like the substance of it is around these technical questions of um, staking mechanisms or whatever. And there's not, there's not as much talk about the social and psychological um, benefits that people seek through participating in these projects. So the link to old school sociology ideas was, I mean, Durkheim had this whole thing a hundred years ago about part of the issue of modern society was anime, right? Normlessness that people have been disconnected from their communities to which they feel they belonged. There was a sort of disassociation in the world of work. And I think what motivated some of the engagement in this stuff is people find a tribe that they feel, a community that they want to belong to, or they see um, their, own, their own dispositions, their own political ideas reflected in, and, but often imperfectly. And so they participate in them and they want this thing to take a certain route um, and then these sort of psychological needs interfere with some of the, the work itself. So I, I could say more about that, but I, I, I just think the way communities acknowledge their ideological orientations and then manage the differences is very interesting and should be talked about more. So I thought that paper was cool. Good on you. Thank you so much. I, I, I dropped out of university, so consider that a, a compliment. <laughs> My parents will be proud. Yes, indeed. Um, do we have do we have the eagerness to talk a bit more? I mean, like we could go on and on about this, and I feel like we've gotten very deep on our sort of introductory session here. It's already gone past an hour, um, and I, I imagine it's quite late now in Mexico. Um, <laughs> Um, there's much to discuss here. I'm, I'm glad that we've actually got a couple of people joining this discussion who are relatively new to, to Decred. Um, and so they've come in with all of this research and background and knowledge, and they've come to pose these questions to Decred. Um, for those who aren't participating live at the moment, there is so much conversation happening in the chat itself. What I'm going to try and do here is pass on this recording to our colleague Exodus, who can maybe somehow make this more attractive, being talking heads, uh, so that we can publish this um, for people to, who didn't participate live right now. They can watch it a bit later. And I'll try and send over the uh, chat transcript as well to see if that helps. Um, are there any sort of final thoughts from any of our panelists here before we start planning for our next session? <laughs> got some smiles here I, I just say that I think uh, I've gone around a full sort of loop of, of like excitement disappointment excitement disappointment about 15 times now with Decred and I think perhaps that that isn't the, nat the natural state of being that it's like there's a sort of uh, you do need to try and build bridges to different people in different groups and I think where the next phase of I'm prepping a, a proposal right now. Um, I think the next phase is a really, really interesting phase. And it touches on all the things that, that, that have been said here that like, can Decred be a community that does enable different political views, different cultural views? Like that's the big question really. And we're, I think why there isn't really an answer is because we're trying to figure it out. And, uh, and, and the hope, uh, like there's a few people I've talked to outside the project and they're like, this is the one project we've seen like where there is potentially the technology and the, and the, and the infrastructure to solve some of the things that have, have been huge issues for digital communities and, for, and, and online communities for, for since they, since they started. So I think that's where we find ourselves really. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're building the system, 
while trying to utilize it as well and then discover how we can utilize it and then build it further. It sort of iterates on itself, um, but it does have some pretty amazing intrinsic capabilities as it is right now. And so we've got, we're empowered to ask these questions, poke and prod and discover together. Elian, say something in Spanish for us, can you? Uh, bueno, les cuento que de Cred es un proyecto maravilloso. Me encanta. <laughs> no, I, I really, I think it, this is, these conversations are quite quite uh, important because, um, as I said, the, the project is constantly iterating. So there is, it is definitely a different project of, of, of how it was a year ago or two years ago, and it definitely will look different in a couple of years. Um, this is what I found fascinating about working in, in a project that it's a protocol in itself. The technology that is being built, it's built in a way that um, anyone can use it. It's, it's open source code. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a protocol level software that we don't know how it's going to look uh, in a couple of years, in a year or in a decade. What we, what we do know is that chances are this, this uh, network, this sort of a collective uh, organism it's probably going to be alive uh, in years to come because it has all the necessary elements for, for it to grow. Um, the treasury, uh, but also the community, uh, the interest, the passion that I, that, that I see in many of the contributors of the project. Um, it really talks about something that is, is set to, to, keep up, to keep on growing and keep, keep on evolving over time. Yeah. Uh I think the other thing that, I mean, maybe for future discussions, um, it, which would be interesting in all of this is just interoperability and where you have these questions around inclusion and exclusion and who this particular infrastructure is for and what it's going to evolve into. Does it need to be everything to everyone or is it um, filling a gap that will be able to interact with other innovations. Um, so I think that so, sometimes we feel like, you know, it's one ring to rule them all with blockchain, but um, I'm not sure that's the future that we're going into. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's probably the, the prevalent, let's call it belief, as far as I'm aware among the creditors is that um, it isn't one blockchain to rule them all. I feel as though that there is opportunity and within Decred itself we have to sort of see how we can develop it out to be what it can be um, so you know we've, we've got lots of suggestions for you know we, we need to come up with a better acronym for this but because once once we've described the governance mechanism to people outside of the cryptocurrency space they're like oh can we have that in our organization so it's this concept of governance as a service or gas I don't know if you can come up with a better acronym than that um, you know, it's, it's, people love it uh, as it is right now. And it's just that, you know, those of us who have spent quite a bit of time with it, we're trying to find a way to methodically, carefully um, and wisely develop it further into being something more. So with that, um, maybe what we can do is discuss this a little bit after we go offline. Um, and we'll stay in touch over the next couple of weeks uh, amongst the panelists. I've got heaps of chatter here, so we'll follow up with some of you in the Decred chat. Um, just a shameless plug here, uh, Decred Australia, at Decred Australia on Twitter. On Facebook, it is facebook.com slash Decred AU. And of course, Decred Project. Uh, you can find all of uh, our panelists on Twitter, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I know that uh, Julian and Ellie uh, on LinkedIn. Um, and someone did mention in the chat, uh, chat.decred.org if you want to chat to us on our Decred channels. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon uh, and we can maybe develop this conversation in this sort of format a little bit further for next time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Get some rest, get some dinner, get some sleep. And good morning. <laughs> Decred is secure, adaptable, sustainable. Learn more at decred.org.